great pays. Today we invite you to go with our commentator to London's Globe Theatre, where from 1599 to 1613, the most precious jewels of English dramatic literature were produced. There you shall witness Christopher Marlowe's first tragedy, Sanderlane, which was destined to open new vistas in English literature and to be a turning point in the poet's career. Both the first and second parts of the play are incorporated in the radio version. Magically, we lift the curtain on the path and take you to the Globe Theatre, typical of the age it glorified when it stood by the River Thames and the place therein Marlowe's Sanderlane took place. A capacity audience is here in the Globe Theatre to greet this afternoon's performance of Tamberlane. The black flag flying from the top of the theatre denotes that today's performance is a tragedy. People from every walk of life are pouring through the front entrance over which hangs the sign of Hercules bearing a globe on his shoulders. The nobles and gallants are continually coming from and going to the tiring house and its dressing rooms at the back of the stage. They seat themselves right on the platform. A three-story structure, flanked by the balconies, rises directly behind the stage. There is no front curtain, but a drapery separates the stage proper from the tiring house. The second story is the actor's gallery, and the third is a cupola. Latecomers from the nearby Falcon Inn, where they have loafed since noon, are jostling their way to the standing room in the balconies. The boxes and galleries are rapidly filling with ladies and gentlemen of quality. The lamps in costly brocaded coats, Stiff Spanish collars, gleaming jewels, and flashing swords bow greetings to their friends. Ladies of rank who seek the seclusion of their private boxes are dressed in silks and velvet. They all wear masks of every hue and color, since ladies do not attend a play without the protection of such disguise. The packed upper balcony is noisy and restless with anticipation. The bugler in the cupola has just blown the last warning that the show is about to begin. The actor who is to speak the prologue has entered the stage. He serves three purposes, to describe the play, to quiet the noisy and eager spectators, and to act as overture to the performance. Listen, the prologue. From digging veins of rhyming mother wit, and such conceits as clownage keeps in pay, we'll lead you to the stately tent of war, where you shall hear the Scythian Tamburlaine threatening the world with highest sounding terms and scourging kingdoms with his conquering sword. View but his picture in his tragic glass, and then applaud his fortunes as you please. The first scene opens in the palace of Mycetes, king of Persia. The aged monarch has called a conference with the warlords of the nation to discuss plans for fighting the insurgent Tamburlaine. An army scavenging our border states. Laying waste in angry stretches our outer land. Who is this Tamburlaine? Some shepherd out of Scythia shielding crags, who now presumes our Persian emperor as the doorway to his stewardship of the world. Our Lord, my cities, noble king of Persia! Lord, hail my cities! Uh, my brother. Here, yeah, my lord. Do I find myself aggrieved? Yet insufficient to express the same, for it requires a great and thundering speech. Uh, good brother, tell the cause unto me, Lord. I know you have a better wit than I. Shall I say, unhappy Persia, that in former age has been the seat of mighty conquerors? Huh? Now Turks and Tartars shake their swords at thee, meaning to mangle all thy provinces? Brother, I see your meaning well enough. I might command you to be slain for saying this. Uh, might I not, Meander? Not for so small a fault, my sovereign lord. Oh, I mean it not. But yet I know I might. For my grief has maddened me. Yet live, yea, live, my faith he wills it so. Oh, Meander, thou, my faithful counsellor, declare the cause of my conceived grief, which is God knows about that tambourine, that like a fox in meets the harvest time to prey upon my flocks of passengers. Oft have I heard your majesty complain of tambourine, that sturdy Syrian thief that robs your merchants of Persepolis, trading by land into the Western Isles. And in your confines, with his lawless train, daily commits incivil outrages, misled by draining prophecies, hoping to reign in Asia, and with barbarous arms to make himself the monarch of the East. At the rhythmus, stand forth, my lord, and hear thy charge. Thou art the hope of Persia, and the very legs whereon our state doth lean as on a staff. Thou shalt be leader of a thousand horse to ensure the death of wicked Tamburlaine. Go, frowning forth. But come thou, smiling home. Before the moon, 
when you have borrowed light. Doubt not, my lord and gracious sovereign. But Tamburlaine and the Tartarian rout shall either perish by our warlike hands or plead for mercy at your highness' feet. Go, thou Sir Edmund, and thy words are swords. And with thy looks thou conquerest all thy foes. And thou, men of art, into city ago, and put thy foot follow, Sir Edmund. Nay, brother, pray you, let him stay. Yes? A greater task sits men upon the warring with a thief. What? Create him Solrex of all Africa, that he may win the Babylonian's heart, which will revolt from Persian government, unless they have a wiser king than you. Unless they have a wiser king than you. But these are his words. Uh, Meander, set them down. And add this to them. But all Asia lament to see the folly of their king. Well, here I swear by this my royal seat to be revenged for these contemptuous words. Meander, come. By my own brother am I thus abused. How oh, now, my lord? <laughs> what, mated and amazed to hear the king thus threatened like himself? <laughs> ah, Menefin, I pass not for his threat. The plot is laid by Persian noblemen and captains of the Medean garrisons to crown me... Emperor of Asia. Well, they should entreat your highness to rejoice, since fortune gives you opportunity to gain the title of conqueror. <laughs> Behold, my lord Atidius has thrust the crown to make the emperor. <laughs> Magnificent and mighty prince, Cosro. We, in the name of other Persian states and commons of this mighty monarchy, present thee with the imperial diadem. Well, since I see the state of Persia droop and languish in my brother's government, I willingly receive the imperial crown and vow to wear it in my country's good, in spite of them shall malice my estate. And in assurance of desired success, we here do crown thee, monarch of the East, emperor of Asia and of Persia. Long live, Cosro, mighty emperor. And Jove may never let me longer live than I may seek to gratify your love and cause the soldiers that thus honor me to triumph over many provinces by whose desires of discipline and arms I doubt not shortly but to reign sole king. And with the army of Thurydemus, whither we shall presently fly, my lord, to rest secure against my brother's force. We knew, my lord, before we brought the crown intending your investion so near the residence of your despised brother, there are in readiness ten thousand horse to carry you from hence. I know it well, my lord. And thank you all. May Allah grant us great success. Praise Allah. And all the while these conferences and strategies are taking place in Persia, Tamburlaine is making his way through the Persian frontier states with his savage troops. Meeting a caravan in the desert, the robber army put it to flight and took as prisoner its leader Magnates and Xenocrate, daughter of the ruler of Egypt. They are being held in Tamburlaine's tent. Yes, sir, Tamburlaine. Pity, fair Xenocrate, undecked and unadorned. Come, lady, let not this appall your thoughts. The jewels and treasure we have gained shall be reserved. And you in better state shall be than if you were arrived in Syria, even in the circle of your father's arms, the mighty Soldan of Egyptia. The Tamburlaine, pity my distressed plight, who, travelling with these Median lords, had passed the army of the mighty Turk, bearing his privy signet and his hand to safe conduct us through Africa. And since we have arrived in Scythia, besides rich presents from the puissant Cam, we have his highness letters to command aid and assistance if we stand in need. But now you see these letters and commands are countermanded by a greater man. But tell me, madam, is your grace betrothed? Yes, my lord, for so you do import. I am a lord, for so my deeds shall prove. Mm -hmm. Though yet a shepherd by my parentage. But, lady, this fair face and heavenly hue must grace his bed that conquers Asia and means to be a terror to the world. He will invest you empress of the East, eh, Achilles? As princely lions when they rouse themselves... Stretching their paws and threatening herds of beasts. So in his armor looketh Tamburlaine. The gods, defenders of the innocent, will never prosper your intended drift that doth oppress poor friendless passengers. Therefore, at least admit us liberty, even as our hopes to be eternized as living Asia's mighty emperor. I hope our latest treasure and our own may serve for ransom to our liberties. Return our mules and empty camels back that we may travel into Syria. And wheresoever we repose ourselves, we will report but well of Tamburlaine. Disdain Xenocrata to live with me. Xenocrata is more worth to Tamburlaine than the possession of the Persian crown, which gracious stars have promised at my birth. A hundred Tartars shall attend on thee, 
Thy garments shall be made of median silk and chased with precious jewels of mine own. All shall we offer to Zenocrita, and then myself. Now, now. In love, Achilles, women must be flattered. But this is she with whom I am in love. You, you. How now, what's the matter? A thousand Persian horsemen are at hand, sent from the king to overcome us all. A thousand horsemen? We, five hundred foot. An odds too great for us to stand against. But are they rich? And is their armor gold? Their plumed helms are wrought with beaten gold. Their swords enameled. And about their necks hang massy chains of gold down to the waist, in every part exceeding brave and rich. Come, let us meet them at the mountain top, and with a sudden and a hot alarm, drive all their horses headlong down the hill. Come, let us march. Stay, Achilles. Ask Apollo first. Lay out our golden wedges to the view, that their reflections may amaze the Persians. But if they offer word of violence, we'll fight 500 men at arms to one before we part with our possession. And against the general, we will lift our swords and either lance his greedy, thirsting throat or take him prisoner, and his chain shall serve for manacles till he be ransomed home. I hear them come. Shall we encounter them? No, keep your standings on that set of foot. Myself will bide the danger of the brunt. Where is the Scythian, Tamburlaine? Whom seeks thou, Persian? I am Tamburlaine. Tamburlaine? Noble and mild this Persian seems to be, if outward habit judge the inward man. His deep affection makes him passionate. With what a majesty he rears his looks. Thou valiant man of Persia, in thee I see the folly of thy emperor. Eh? Art thou but captain of a thousand horse, that by characters graven in thy brows and by thy martial face and stout aspect, deserves to have the leading of an host? Hmm? Forsake thy king, and do but join with me. And we will triumph over all the world. I hold the fates bound fast in iron chains, and with my hand turn fortune's wheel about. And sooner shall the sun fall from his sphere than Tamburlaine be slain or overcome. And as a sure and grounded argument that I shall be monarch of the East, he sends Zenocrata, the Soldan's daughter, rich and brave, to be my queen and portly empress. If thou wilt stay with me, renowned man, and lead thy thousand horse with my conduct, both we will reign as councils of the earth, and mighty kings shall be our senators. Hmm. What strong enchantments enticed my yielding soul to thee, noble Syrian. Shall I prove a traitor to my king? No, but the trusty friend of Tamburlaine. Hmm. One with thy words, and conquered with thy looks. I yield myself, my men, and horse to thee, to be partaker of thy good or ill. As long as life maintains. Theridibus. Theridibus, my friend. Take here my hand, which is as much as if I swore by heaven and called the gods to witness of my vow. Noble Tamburlaine. A thousand thanks worthy, Theridibus. And now, fair madam and my noble lords, if you will willingly remain with me, you shall have honors as your merits be. Or else you shall be forced with slavery. We yield unto the happy Tamburlaine. For you then, madam, I am out of doubt. I must be pleased before wretched, wretched democracy. A short distance away, another sector of the Persian army nears Tamburlaine's camp. Khosro, who stole his brother's crown and title as emperor of Persia, has a special reason to make a speedy contact with the young revolutionary. Thus far are we towards Rhythmus and Valiant Tamburlaine, the man of fame. But tell me that a senior man of fame. What stature wheel is he? And what person is he? Of stature, tall and stately fashion. Such breadth of shoulders as might mainly bear old Atlas's burden. His lofty brows enfold the figure death, and about them hangs a knot of amber hair. His arms and fingers long and sinuous. In every part proportioned like the man should make the world subdued to Tamberlaine. Well hast thou portrayed in thy terms of life the face and personage of a wondrous man. Such a man is not by nature thief, and foolishly is hunted to an early death. In fair Persia, noble Tamburlaine shall be my regent and remain as king. In happy hour we set the crown upon your kingly head. Our army will be 40,000 strong when Tamburlaine and brave Theridamus have met us by the river of Aris, and all conjoin to meet the witless king, my brother, that now is marching near to Parthia, and with unwilling soldiers faintly armed to seek revenge on me and Tamburlaine. Go and see Menefant. Direct me straight. I will, my lord.
Moving more slowly, the army of my cities rests in camp within an hour's ride of Candelaine. It is early morning, and a vast, unbroken plain stretches before my city's tent. In the distance, there are a few low hills. Come, my Leander. Let us to this gear. I tell you true, my heart is swollen with wrath of this same thievish villain, Tamerlane, and of that false Cosro, my traitorous brother. Who did not grieve a king to be so abused and have a thousand horsemen taken away? And which is worse, to have his diadem sought for by such scald knaves as love him not? Then, by heavens, I swear, I will have Cosro by the head and kill proud Tamerlane with point of sword. Uh, tell you the rest, Meander, I have said. Prepare to fight! He that can take or slaughter Tamerlane shall rule the province of Albania. Who brings that traitor's head, Theridamus, shall have a government in media besides the spoil of him and all his train. As you see, my sages. Uh, what is it, man? I have returned from scouting on these champion plains, and I have viewed the army of the Scythians. It lies in crouching rest behind those hills, and I report it far exceeds our own angry number. My sages, fighting more for honor than for gold, shall massacre those greedy-minded slaves. And when their scattered army is subdued, and you men march upon their slaughtered carcasses, you shall share equally the gold that bought their lives and live like gentlemen in Persia. He tells you true, my master, so he does. Strike up the drum and march courageously. Fortune herself just sit upon our crest. And behind those low hills, his army doubled in strength, Tamberlane watches the same rising sun that warms the aged body of Mycetes. Now, worthy Tamberlane, have I reposed in thy approved fortunes all my hope. What thinks our man shall come of our attempt? Mistake you not a whit, my lord. Our fates and oracles of heaven have sworn to royalize the deeds of Tamberlane. <laughs> Haste, Kazru, to be king alone, that I wish these my friends and all my men may triumph in our long-expected fate. The king, your brother, is now hard at hand. Meet with the fool and rid your royal shoulders of such a burden as outweighs the sand. <laughs> we are enough to scare the enemy and more than needs to make an emperor. And now, friends, to horse! Cosro, tis he who is our emperor now, young genius brother to the witless king, my city. Aye, Cosro is a man of strength and spirit. Tis Cosro had the thought to make a friend of Tamerlane when other men had vowed his sudden death. While Cosro reigns in Persia, while my Satis, his poor star-brained brother, now is holding court among the roots. <laughs> the dead rules safely, but with a mighty pump. That befits my Satis. May Allah keep his soul. Look. They come, the general. Tell me, which is he, the Scythian shepherd whose far flung name has put the earth of beasts to flight? There upon the charger, that is Tamberlane. Oh. Cosro rides just in his right. See, their heads are linked together in some common humor. Ha, oh, Cosro. With my fate is dead, think thyself invested now as royally as if as many kings as could encompass thee with greatest pomp had crowned the emperor. So I do, thrice renowned man at arms. And none shall help me keep the crown but Tamberlane. Thee do I make my regent of Persia and general lieutenant of my armies. And now, Lord Tamberlane, my brother's camp I leave to thee and to Theridamus. Then follow me to fair Persepolis. He rides in triumph through Persepolis. Is it not brave to be a king, Achilles, and ride in triumph through Persepolis? Oh, my lord, it is sweet and full of pomp. To be a king is half to be a god. A god is not so glorious as a king. I think the pleasure they enjoy in heaven cannot compare with kingly joys in earth. What say then, Thrudimus? Wilt thou be king? <laughs> Though I praise it, I can live without it. What say, my friend Achilles? Wilt thou be king? Aye, if I could with all my heart, my lord. <laughs> Why, that's well said, Achilles. So would I. Well, what then, my lord? I am strongly moved that if I should desire the Persian crown, I could obtain it with a wondrous ease. Eh, Theridamus? Aye, Tamberlane. The strength that made the kingdom could undo it. The crown itself is nothing, just the cap of gold. The hand that fashioned it to Cosro's head could unseat it and 
remake its shape. Well, Theridamus, I'll first to say to get the Persian kingdom to myself. Then thou for Parthia, they for Scythia and Media. And if I prosper, all shall be as sure as if the Turk, the Pope, Africa, and Greece came creeping to us with their crowns apiece. Then shall we send to this triumphant king and bid him battle for his novel crown? To prove a pretty jest to charge on 20,000 men. Then shalt thou see the Scythian Tambourine win the Persian crown. Take it. Take a thousand horse with thee and bid Cosmo turn back to war with us that only made him king for sport. Haste thee, Tichelis, we will follow thee. And what saith the Rhythmus? Go, and I go with thee. Then, to horse! To horse! To horse! Peters, hold your sword! I must surrender. Ah! That blow, Tamburine, not only cut my side, but loose the crown of Persia from my grasp. What? Cosro Fallen, you have only yielded back to me the strength I gave you. Barbarous and bloody Tamburine, thus to deprive me of my crown and life. Treacherous and false to the even at the morning of my happy state, scarce being seated in my royal throne to work my downfall and in time and end. Nature doth teach us, doth teach us all to have aspiring minds. That made me to join this tambourine, for he is like the massy earth that moves not upwards, nor by princely deeds doth mean to soar above the highest sort. And that made us the friends of tambourine, to lift our swords against the Persian king. So do we hope to reign in Asia, the strangest men that ever nature made. I know not how to take their tyranny. My bloodless body waxes chill and cold, and with my life, my life slides through my wound. My soul begins to take her flight to hell, and summons all my senses to depart. Seldomus and Tamburlaine, I die, and fearful vengeance light upon you both. Tamburlaine, Cosgrove's death remakes that golden cap. Though Mars himself, the angry god of arms, conspires to dispossess me of this diadem, yet will I wear it in spite of him, as if the gods had held a parliament and all pronounced me king of Persia. With the first great obstacle surmounted and his army triumphant in Persia, Tamburlaine is well on his way toward a great victory over the entire world. This character of Tamburlaine fascinates the audience, for he personifies the Machiavellian conqueror by divine right, a truly heroic and noble figure in the eyes of the English, who were just then commencing the great golden age of Elizabeth, when England ruled the world. Now the next scene is the palace of Bajaset, emperor of the Turks. A slave sounds the great gong and the assembled nobles listen. Bajaset speaks. Great kings of Barbary and my portly vassals, we hear the Tartars and the eastern thieves under the conduct of one Tamburlaine presume a bickering with your emperor and think to rouse us from our dreadful siege of the famous Grecian Constantinople. Renowned emperor and mighty general. I listen to the king of Fez. What if you sent the vassals of your guard to charge him to remain in Asia or else to threaten death and deadly arms as from the mouth of mighty bards. I depart to Persia. Tell him thy lord, the Turkish emperor, wills and commands not once to set his foot in Africa. Most great recent monarch of the earth, your vassal will accomplish your behest and show your pleasure to the Persian. I have fit the legate of the stately Turk. Meanwhile, in a special tent apart from the army, Xenocrate is still the prisoner of Tamburlaine. Magnetus? Magnetus? Yes, Xenocrate. The Magnetus, watchful, ever watchful comrade, first lord of my father's rule and nearest friend of mine. Tell me, is the dawn yet come? I cannot sleep. My thoughts are all conspired to keep me restless on my couch. Oh, Xenocrate. May I presume to know the cause of these unquiet fits that work such trouble to your wanted rest? 
Tis more than pity such a heavenly face should by heart sorrow wax so wan and pale. Ah, life and soul still hover in his breast and leave my body senseless as the earth or else unite us to his life and soul that I may live and die with Tamburlaine. With Tamburlaine? Oh, fair Zanocrate, let not a man so vile and barbarous that holds you from your father in despite and keeps you from the honors of a queen, being supposed his worthless concubine. Let not that man be honored with your love. Now the mighty seldom hears of you. Your highness needs not doubt, but in a short time, he will, with Tamburlaine's destruction, redeem you from this deadly servitude. Please to wound me with these words. and speak of Tamburlaine as he deserves. The entertainment we have had of him is far from villainy or servitude, and might in noble minds be counted princely. You see, though first the king of Persia, being a shepherd, seemed to love you much, now in his majesty he leaves those looks, those words of favor, and those comfortings, and gives no more than common courtesies. Common courtesies? His exceeding favors have deserved and might content the queen of heaven. As well as it hath changed my first conceived disdain. Higher would I rear my estimate than Juno, sister to the highest god, if I were matched with mighty Tamburlaine. Tamburlaine, Tamburlaine, does your golden cape of day lay bear some danger to our camp? A messenger, an emissary from the Turks. Their scattered armies welded in one force confront us on the plain below. Tamburlaine. Hold, what seek you? I seek Tamburlaine. What wish you with our lord? I come with word from all Puissons, Bajazet, Emperor of Turkey and Regent of these Afric states. Any word you have for him can pass through my ears for distillation. Hey, I'll see the man. I am Tamburlaine. How straight and strong he stands. The morning sun takes brilliance from his brow. I bring a challenge from the assembled kings of Africa and in their name deny you right to set your course across their plains. Ma'am, by this gathering of arms upon the hills, I, Lord and Master, knows I mean to meet him here in Bithynia and prove my right to enter on these beckoning lands before me. <laughs> Turks are full of brags and menace more than they can well perform. View well my camp and speak indifferently. Do not my captains and my soldiers look as if they meant to conquer Africa? Your men are valiant, but their number few, and cannot terrify his mighty host. The Lord, the great commander of the world, hath now in arms ten thousand Janissaries. The more he brings, the greater is the spoil. Then fight courageously. Their crowns are yours. This hand shall set them on your conquering heads that made me emperor of Asia. This is three millions infinite of men, yet we assure us of the victory. Well said, Achilles. Speak in that mood, for will and shall best fit of Tamburlaine. My lord Bajazet deigns to pay visit to this camp. Bassos and Janissaries of my guard, attend upon the person of your lord, the greatest potentate of Africa. Tamburlaine? Which is he? Turk, I am Tamburlaine, and know that those who lead my horse shall lead thee captive through Africa. Leave words! Men, let them feel your lance's points, which glided through the Greeks. Zabina, my queen, mother of three braver boys than Hercules, sit here upon this royal chair of state, and on thy head wear my imperial crown, until I bring this Sturdy Tamburlaine, and all his captains bound in captive chains. Such good success happened to Bajazet. Zenocrata? Yes, my lord Tamburlaine. Zenocrata, loveliest maid alive, the only paragon of Tamburlaine, whose eyes are brighter than the lamps of heaven. Sit down by her, adorned with my crown as if thou wert the empress of the world, and manage words with her, Zabina, as we will arms with these presumptuous foes. And may thou, my love, return with victory and free from wounds. Now shalt thou feel the force of Turkish arms, which lately made all Europe quake for fear. Our conquering sword shall marshal us the way. My camp is like to Julius Caesar's host that never fought but had the victory. But come, my lords, to weapons let us fall. The field is ours, the Turk, his wife, and all.
Come, kings and vassals, let us glut our swords that first to drink the feeble Persian blood. This woman must thou be placed by me that am the empress of the mighty Turk. This damsel Turkish, callst thou me base? that am betrothed unto the great and mighty Tamburlaine. To Tamburlaine, the great Tartarian thief, thou wilt repent these lavish words of thine, when I great Basso master and thyself must plead for mercy at his kingly seat, and sue to me to be your advocate. And sue to thee. I tell thee, shameless girl, thou shalt be longest to my waiting maid. <laughs> Hearest thou, Amity, how my slave doth menace? She, for her sauciness, shall be employed to dress the common soldiers meat and drink. For we will scorn she should come near ourselves. Oh, yet sometimes let your highness send for her to do the work my chambermaid disdained. <laughs> <laughs> ah, curse you, Tamburlaine. There lies my sword. Now, king of battles, who is conqueror? Now... By the fortune of the spoil. Where are your stout contributory kings? We have their crowns, their bodies through the field. Each man a crown. Why, kingly fortifice. Deliver them into the treasury. Though I be prisoner, I may be ransomed. Not all the world shall ransom, Bajazet. Ah, we have lost the field. And never had the Turkish emperor so great a foil by any foreign foe. Those wallet garrisons will I subdue and write myself great lord of Africa. So from the east unto the furthest west shall Tamburlaine extend his puissant arm. And by this means I'll win the world at last. Yet set a ransom on me, Tamburlaine. What? <laughs> Thinkst thou, Tamburlaine, esteems thy gold? I'll make the kings of India ere I die offer their minds to sue for peace to me and dig for treasure to appease my wrath. Come, find them both. Bring them in. And for this happy conquest, Triumph and solemnize a martial feast. The spectators are wildly cheering the exploits of their legendary hero, Tamerlane, shouting their approval at the top of their lungs. We pause for station identification. The play continues. The next scene is a roadside camp where the victorious army pauses on its march to Damascus. The captive emperor of Turkey is locked in a caged wagon. His wife, proud Queen Fadina, walks beside the crude prison. I call a halt in this cool spot because my heart has distilled a drop of pity. Pity for me? Then keep it for a moistener on your own misdeeds. But do not throw it arms like at these feet who have tried triumphant over all of Turkey. <laughs> Pity for Bajazet, who had none himself save for himself. <laughs> Pity for the slaving wretches who do pull thy cage. They must perforce work close beside thee and need a respite for their odious labors. Well, soldiers, I call for a footstool, as any monarch might. Bring him forth. <laughs> Ye holy priests of heavenly Mohammed, that sacrificing slice and cut your flesh, staining his altars with your tarpid blood, make heaven to frown, and every fixed star to suck up poison from the Moorish fens, and pour it in this glorious tyrant's throat. Fall prostrate on the low disdainful earth, and be the footstool of great Tamburlaine that I may rise into my royal throne. Sacrifice my heart to death and hell before I yield to such a slavery. Stoop, villain! And as I look down to the damned fiends, fiends look on me. And thou, dread god of hell, with ebon scepter, strike this hateful earth and make it swallow both of us at once. Unworthy king, that by thy cruelty unlawfully usurped the Persian feet, bearest to thou that never saw an emperor before thou met my husband in the field, being I captive thus abused his taste. Keeping his kingly body in its 
king, that a roof of gold and sun-bright palaces should have prepared to entertain his place, and treading him beneath thy loathsome feet, who speak the kings of Africa have kissed. You must devise some torment worse, my lord, to make these captives rain their lavish tongues. Democracy, look better to your slave. She is my handmaid slave, and she shall look that these abuses flow not from her tongue. Chide her, Anipi. Let these be warnings then for you, my slave, how you abuse the person of the king, or else I swear to have you whipped stark naked. Great Tamburlaine, great in my overthrow. Ambitious pride shall make thee fall as low for treading on the back of Bajazeth that should be horsed on four mighty kings. Thy names and titles and thy dignities are fled from Bajazet and remain with me that will maintain it against a world of kings. Put him in again. <clears throat> Is this a place for mighty Bajazet? Confusion laid on him that helps thee thus. There while he lives shall Bajazet be kept. And where I go, be thus in triumph drawn. And thou, his wife, shall feed him with the scraps my servitors shall bring thee from my board. These moors that drew him from Bithynia to fair Damascus, where we now remain, shall lead him with us wheresoever we go. Now may we see Damascus' lofty towers that spread their wings upon the city walls. The townsmen's mask in silk and cloth of gold and every house is as a treasury. The men, the treasure, and the town are ours. Your tents of white now pitched before the gates, and gentle flags of amity displayed. I doubt not that the governor will yield, offering Damascus to your majesty. So shall we have his life and all the rest. But if he stay until the bloody flag be once advanced on my vermilion tent, he dies. And those that kept us out so long, not one should escape, but perish by our swords. And now to horse. And see if fair Damascus can open to our brave assault with welcome for its destined king. Yet hold your still at arms and rest, lest we are forced to play the tyrant to this city. And you, Bajazet, bear careful watch how Tamburlaine assumes the city. Tis no greater task to him than laying waste an empire such as yours. <laughs> and Nippy. See you yet the gaudy flag of Tamburlaine flying on Damascus' wall? No, my lady queen. Still, an aureate glow has cast the night aside. Damascus burns beneath the ravagings of our lord. Oh, I would be traitor to my native land and see it fall a victim to the noisiest horde than watch it burn beneath its own defense. And nippy, does the flag of victory shame Damascus' gate as yet? And tell us in physician's terms this hemorrhage has ceased. No, my lady. Still, the smoldering fires keep Damascus Towers a fine pretender for the coppery sun. Look at soft. Tambling is crossing to this tent. Ah, oh, my fair democracy. I, another king, and thou, another queen, shall be within the hour. My men are left to quiet the final fluttering of this city of our latest glance. Damascus will be ours. But thou art sad. Pray tell me why. My lord, to see my father's town besieged. The country wasted where myself was born. How can it but afflict my very soul? If any love remain in you, my lord, or if my love unto your majesty may merit favor at your highness' hands, then raise your siege from fair Damascus' walls, and with my father make a friendly truce. Xenocrates, were Egypt Jove's own land, yet would I with my sword make Jove to stoop. I will confute those blind geographers that make a triple region of the world, excluding regions which I mean to trace, and with this pen reduce them to a map, calling the provinces, cities, and towns after my name and thine, Xenocrates. Here at Damascus will I make the point that shall begin the perpendicular. And wouldst thou have me buy thy father's love at such a loss? Tell me, Xenocrates. Honor, wait, unhappy Tamburlaine. Yet give me leave to plead for him, my lord. Content yourself. This person shall be safe, and all the friends of fair Zenocrity, if with their lives they will be pleased to yield. Arthur Rydimus. My lord. A look and tell us if the town be ransacked. Aye, my lord. Tamburlaine. Aye, Tegelius. The town is ours, my lord, and fresh supply of conquest and of spoil is offered us. That's well, Tegelius. What's the news? The Sultan and the Arabian king together march on us with such eager violence as if there were no way but one with us. 
No more there is not, I warrant thee, to kill it. We know the victory is ours, my lord. But let us save the Reverend Soldan's life for fair Zenocrity. That so laments his state. That we will chiefly see unto, Thrudimus. For sweet Zenocrity, whose worthiness deserves a conquest over every heart. The Reverend Soldan, father to Zenocrity, shall live. And now, Bajas at my footstool, here you will stay till we have made us ready for the field. <laughs> Pray for us, Bajazet. We are going. Go. Never to return with victory. Millions of men encompass thee about. Let all the swords and lances in the field stick in his breast. As in their proper room. Ah, fair Zabina. We may curse his power. But such a star hath influence in his sword. Then is there left no Muhammad. No God. Why should we live that all the world will see and laugh to scorn the former triumphs of our mightiness in this obscure infernal servitude? Sweet Bajazet, I will prolong thy life as long as any blood or spark of breath can quench or cool the torments of my grief. Now, Bajazet, abridge thy baneful days and beat the brains out of thy conquered head. Oh, no! Since no. other means are all forbidden me that may be ministers of my decay. O oh, highest lamp of ever-living Jove, let the stony dart of senseless cold pierce through the center of my withered heart and make a passage for my loaded life. Oh! Oh! oh. What do my eyes behold? My husband dead. Oh, Bajazet, my husband and my lord, I follow thee. I come. I come. Come, happy father of Zenocrity, a title higher than thy Sheldon's name. Though my right hand has thus enthralled thee, thy princely daughter here shall set thee free. Oh, sight thrice welcome to my joyful soul, to see the king, my father, issue safe from dangerous battle of my conquering love. Well met, my only dear Zenocrity, though with the loss of Egypt and my crown. Twas I, my lord, that get the victory, and therefore grieve not at your overthrow, since I shall render all into your hands and add more strength to your dominion. Mighty hath God and Muhammad made thy hand, renowned Tamburlaine, to whom all kings of force must yield their crowns and emperies. And I am pleased with this my overthrow, if as beseems a person of thy state, thou hast with honor used Zenocrate. Her state and person want no pomp, you see. Invest her here, the queen of Persia. What saith the noble Soldan and Zenocrate? I yield with thanks, and protestations of endless honor to thee for her love. Then let us set the crown upon her head. As long hath lingered for so high a feat. My hand is ready to perform the deed. For now her marriage time shall work us rest. And here's the crown, my lord. Help set it on. Then sit thou down, divine Zenocrate. And here we crown thee queen of Persia and all the kingdoms and dominions that late the power of Tamburlaine subdued. And now, my lords and loving followers that purchased kingdoms by your martial deeds, cast off your armor, put on scarlet robes, Mount up your royal places of estate, and there make laws to rule your province. For Tamburlaine takes truce with all the world. Then, after all these solemn exequies, we will our rites of marriage solemnize. The capture of Damascus, the consolidation of his eastern empire, and finally his wedding to Zenocrate and alliance with her father, Sultan of Egypt, Tamburlaine continues in his quest for world power. His dreams, seen when he was but a shepherd on the Scythian hillside, are fast becoming realities. But in the north... Oh, my God. 
And yet, with all the world in arms against him, Tamburlaine has kept his conquered empire intact. Sons were born to Xenocrate and grew to their father's strength. They share his vision of a world conquered. In Damascus, he waits through the years for his army to be replenished with young men so that he may continue his conquest of the world and make that dream a reality. Sweet Tamburlaine, when wilt thou leave these arms and save thy sacred person free from scathe and dangerous chances of the wrathful war? When heaven shall cease to move on both the poles, and when the ground whereon my soldiers march shall rise aloft and touch the horned moon, and not before, my sweet Sinocrate. So grew the armies of his enemies. Throughout the world, men massed troops and trained them for the day they could safely attack the hated monarch. My royal army is as great as his. Right ways and tears of Turkey. Play them in. Get all your thoughts to mangle Tamberlane. From Palestine to Jerusalem, of Hebrews, three score those fighting men. to my band's full 50,000 more. The fighting know not what retreat does mean. On Then welcome, Tamberlane, unto thy death. Come, sweet on thy joy. Let us to the field and sacrifice mountains of breathless men to Muhammad, who now with joy opens the firmament to see the slaughter of our enemies. And so the world moves to battle, Tamburlaine against the world. But it is no defeat by mortal hands that strikes grief to his great heart, even as the grand army of his enemies march into his border territories. A simpler enemy strikes within his palace. Physician, if the four great humors of the earth have ceased to flow within that fevered body... Then should I tear the very ground aside and seek the lively spirits at their source, jangle them with these two hands and force their course through Xenocrates' fair heart. She shall not die. There is no death so large that it can hold her spirit after flight. My lad, if I could be a traitor to the very truths which I profess, that would I do to keep thy dying queen alive. But alas, the truth will bear no traitors. It simply is the truth as it appears. No man on earth, nor strength below, nor power above, can for a jot prolong her dying breath. Black is the beauty of the brightest day. The golden ball of heaven's eternal fire, that danced with glory on the silver waves, now wants the fuel that inflames his beams. Xenocrate, that gave him light and life, whose eyes shot fire from their ivory boughs and tempted every soul with lively heat. Now, by the malice of the angry skies, whose jealously admits no second mate, draws in the comfort of her latest breath, all dazzled with the hellish mists of death. Oh, yet let me kiss me, Lord, before I die. And let me die with kissing of my Lord. But since my life is lengthened yet a while, let me take leave of these, my loving sons, and of these lords, whose true nobility has merited my latest memory. Sweet sons, farewell. In death, we then believe that in your lives, your father's excellence. Oh, proud. Fury and intolerable fit. The dares torment the body of my love and scourge the scourge of the immortal God. Now are those spheres where Cupid used to sit, wounding the world with wonder and with love, sadly supplied with pale and ghastly death. 
whose darts do pierce the center of my soul. Her sacred beauty hath enchanted heaven. And had she lived before the siege of Troy, Helen, whose beauty summoned Greece to arms and drew a thousand ships to Tenedos, had not been named in Homer's Iliad. And now, my ship will cease, my lord. What? Is she dead? To kill it. Draw thy sword, and wound the earth that it may cleave in twain, and we descend into the infernal vaults, to hail the fatal sisters by the hair and throw them in the triple moat of hell, for taking hence my fair Zenocrita. The Kellys, the rumors to arms, raise cavaliers higher than the clouds, and with the cannon break the frame of heaven, batter the shining palace of the sun, and shiver all the starry firmament. For amorous Jove hath snatched my love from hence, meaning to make her stately queen of heaven. Come down from heaven and live with me again. Ah, good my lord, be patient. She is dead. And all this raging cannot make her live. If words might serve, our voice hath rent the air. If tears, our eyes have watered all the earth. If grief, our murdered hearts have strained forth blood. Nothing prevails. For she is dead, my lord. Oh, she is dead. Oh, thy words do pierce my soul. Ah, oh, sweet to kill us, say no more. Though she be dead, yet let me think she lives and feed my mind that dies for want of her. This cursed town will I consume with fire, because this place bereft me of my love. The houses burnt will look as if they mourned, and here will I set up her statue and march about it with my morning camp, drooping and pining for Xenocracy. Come, sweet on viceroys, to the field, and welcome, Tamburlaine, to thy death. Thy foes are eager for thy swift defeat. Our armies madden at the sound of thy dread name. and seeks to conquer mighty Tamburlaine. Shall sickness prove me now to be a man that has been turned to terror of the world? To Kelly's and the rest, come, take your swords and threaten him whose hand afflicts my soul. Come, let us march against the powers of heaven and set black streamers in the firmament to signify the slaughter of the gods. Oh, friends, what shall I do? I cannot stand. Come, carry me to war against the gods that envy me thus the health of Tamburlaine. Ah, good my lord, leave these impatient words. Would add much danger to your malady. Why? Why shall I sit and languish in this pain? No. No, strike the drums, and in revenge of this to Kelly's, peace to the court of Jove. Will him to send Apollo hither straight to cure me. Or I'll fetch him down myself. Sit still, my gracious lord. This grief will cease and cannot last. It is so violent. Fate of your majesty to drink this potion which will abate the fury of your fit and cause some milder spirits to govern you. Tell me. What, what think you of my sickness now? Your veins are full of accidental heat. Cannot endure by argument of art. Yet, if your majesty may escape this day, no doubt that you shall soon recover all. Then will I comfort all my vital parts and live in spite of death above a day. Your pains do pierce our soul. No hope survive. For by your life we entertain our lives. But sons, this subject, not of force enough to hold the fiery spirit it contains, must part. Imparting his impressions by equal portions into both your breasts. My flesh, divided in your precious shapes, 
shall still retain my spirit. Though I die, I live in all your seed immortally. Then, now remove me that I may resign my place and proper title to my son. First, take my scourge and my imperial crown and mount my royal chariot of estate that I may see thee crowned before I die. Help me, help me, my lords, to make my last remove. Heavens witness me with what a broken heart. Farewell, my boy. My dearest friend, farewell. My body feels, my soul doth weep to see your sweet desires deprive my company. For tumbling. The scourge of God must die. This radio version of Christopher Marlowe's Tambourine has been forth in a series of great plays presented each Saturday afternoon at the same time over the same station. The adaptation was by Brevin Davis and the performance was directed by Albert N. Williams. Members of the cast included... Tambourine, Richard Colmar. Sinocrity, K. Strutzi. Mercedes, Richard Shelley. Cosro, Bertrand Hamden. Meander, Mark Smith. Eurydimus, Charles Webster. Ortigius, Dennis Hoy. Menaphon, Ralph Locke. Cacellus, Herbert Dean. Badgeza, Carl Eastman, King of Furs. Earl Larimore, Soldan of Egypt, Stanley Waxman, Ajidas, John Brewster, Enipi, Ruth Warwick, Sabina, Florence Malone, Arcanus, Douglas Ferguson, Gazellus, Ralph Locke, Calatine, Earl Larimore, The Physician, Marlo Bolton, The Prologue, Bernard Lindro, Messenger, Louis Van Ruten, Soldier, Peter Beauvais, and commentator, Jack Costello. Next week at the same hour, the National Broadcasting Company will present Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. This has been an NBC educational feature. This is the National Broadcasting Company.